Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. And I just want to read our, our passage for today and encourage you to follow along, beginning with verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Maybe I could get this volume down there. It's just ringing in my ears. Is it, that's a little better, right? Uh, is the temperature okay for you? <laughs> um, let's start over. And the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things, says he who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know your works, speaking to the church, and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas, my faithful martyr who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. I have a few things against you because you have those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, Jesus says. Repent or else I come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone. And on the stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So Lord, help us to, to hear what the Spirit would say to us. And as was prayed earlier, that our hearts would be open, that we would respond to what you have to say to each of us individually and corporately. And Lord, may you speak your word to us today, and may we find ourselves receiving and fruit produced as it takes root in a good heart. Help us to keep our hearts clean, Lord, so the seed can be planted and that it might grow and produce. We ask it. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Grab a seat if you would. As you know, the book of Revelation begins with seven letters to seven churches. We've looked at the first two, Ephesus. And Jesus said of Ephesus, you've lost your first love. Smyrna, persecuted, pierced. The Lord says you're poor, but you're rich. And I know your circumstances. I know, he says. I know your situation. And now in chapter 2, verse 12, we have the church of Pergamos. And he says, He who has the sharp two edged sword is coming. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And he talks about Balaam and Balak, and he talks about the Nicolaitans. And, and I want you to, to, to tune in. Let, let me have your attention for just a moment. The issues that are going on in Pergamos, the problems and the circumstances well, they're, they're a lot like the problems and circumstances that are going on in, in our world, in our culture today. Not so much persecution. I don't think many of us know any martyrs in America. It's not that. It's not so much, you know, uh, the loss of first love that's going on in Pergamos. But the issues in Pergamos are, well, he, he mentioned sexual immorality, compromise, corruption in the church. And, and we live in this culture today where there's, wow, there's just innumerable sexual abuses in churches, and not just the Catholic church, although we're aware of that. We've got crazy stuff in our culture. 
stuff that goes on in Pergamos. We, we today are walking through the, the ordination of homosexual pastors of mainline denominations in our culture. Leaders who, and people in general who are no longer concerned about, well, divorce. Who cares? We live in this, this kind of crazy upside-down culture where you can be asexual, bisexual, bigender. It, it's it's mind-blowing what, what's going on, the feminization of the American male, the explosion of legalized drugs, the, the educational system that, that is almost like in combat with some of the parents when it has to do with the basic understanding of gender and biology and history. Is this uncomfortable yet? <laughs> it's a little PG-13 today. What's going on in Pergamos is a church flirting with corruption, immorality, and false teaching. It was kind of like how Paul addressed the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I've got a verse uh, 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. And he goes and he outlines the fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And he says, such were some of you. And, and, and it's, a, it's something that, that you know, was, was all the way back in the time of the apostles the church of Corinth, and certainly in our culture today. I mean, what's going on in Pergamos? I mean, listen to this, this verse, chapter 2 of Revelation, verse 13. I know your works, where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. I mean, what in the world is going on with that? I know where you dwell, where Satan is, and where is throne is. It's like, what are you, driving into Pergamos and there's a sign? Welcome to Pergamos. Satan dwells here. And his throne is here. Have a nice time. <laughs> you know, it's like, what, what, what is this? It, it says, not only that, but I have a martyr there, Antipas, my faithful. He was killed among you. And I have these things against you because there are those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat sacrifices to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Smyrna had persecution. Ephesus lost their first love. There's a martyr in Pergamos, so, so they've had hard times. And hard times are, well, they're hard. And a lot of people give up when things get hard. A lot of people say, you know, what's going on? I thought Christianity, I was going to be, you know, blessed, and now I'm, I've got difficulties, there's issues in my life, and, and, and God, where are you in the midst of all of this? And people want to, people quit. Even in Jesus' teaching one time, he was teaching some people, they said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And it said, and many followed him no more, even turned to his own disciples, said, do you want to go away also? And I, and I love it. There was Peter who spoke up as he usually does, but he said this, he says, Lord, where would we go? You alone have the words of eternal life, and we know and have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God. He said, I've got nowhere else to go but you, Jesus. But, but hard times come. And some people, when hard times come, they, 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 they fight, they resist, they, they kind of dig their feet in. And so the enemy comes along like he did in Pergamos with another tactic, maybe enticement, temptation, seduction. Oh, oh, you won't give in to hard times? Well, how about money? Maybe that'll lure you away. Or, or, or how about a handsome or pretty co-worker? Or pornography or drunkenness or drugs? As Jesus deals with this church that is listening to false teaching and seduction that's beginning to lead to false lifestyles and actions. 
He says, I'm coming to you as the one who has the sharp two-edged sword, which we know over and over again is the word of God. And it's double-edged. And he said, I'm going to deal with the teachings of Balaam, and I'm going to deal with the teachings of the Nicolaitans. I'm going to deal with both. It's dealing with your mind being deceived by what's not true, and it's dealing with your heart and your emotions as they're led away by temptation and seduction. It's this, this, this Word of God that comes. See, the Word of God, the Bible, I would submit to you, it's not mystical. It's not incomprehensible. It's not religious weird writings that don't make sense. Uh, the, the Bible, if you, if you read it, it's very practical. Sometimes it's way too practical. It's very understandable. It's very real. It's very true. I mean, if you want weird, check out some of the different religious paths in our culture today. Check out Scientology. You ever check that out? You once were a Thetan. I don't know if you know much about it. This is this kind of weird alien. You once were a Thetan, and you've got engrams in your mind, and, and they have to be removed by someone who has an e-meter, and it costs a bunch of money. <laughs> and you go from stage to stage till finally you're, you're clear, and all the Thetan is gone. I can set you up with that. Now, that's weird. Or Mormonism with its polygamy roots and its power structure, that, that's some weird stuff there. And Jesus is an angel, and then there's Christian science where you don't ever have to get sick. Those are some weird things, crazy stuff. But the Bible, boy, it, it's practical, it's historical, it's factual, it's truthful, it makes sense. And beyond all that, it's life-transforming. And so Jesus says, I'm coming to you with the word, the two-edged sword. And I'm going to cut into it through all the nonsense. So you pick up the Bible, even at the very beginning, you start to read it, and it goes, in the beginning, God created. It doesn't say you were an ape. It doesn't say you were a thetan. It says you were created a man and a woman. And you go, yeah, that, that seems to make sense. And you fell, you drifted, and God began to pursue mankind to finally he revealed himself in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And the word goes forth like a sword, and it begins to open you up, and it begins to reveal who God is. Here, here in this, this chapter, he's dealing with some untruth and some lifestyle issues. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast in my name. You didn't deny my faith, even in days which Antipas, my faithful martyr who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. Here's what he's saying. I know you dwell in a wicked city. There's a stronghold that the enemy has there, he says. It's a city given over to idolatry and and paganism. Uh, Satan's throne is there, and there on the hillside in the, the center of Pergamos, which could be seen all over the city, was a 40-foot high throne built for the false god Zeus. And you could see it from almost anywhere in the city. It was a monument to a false god. It's Sin City, and there was pagan rites involved with it. And he says, you, you didn't deny me, even when Antipas was put to death. You knew you were strong, you stood, but, but let me have your attention, he says. You refused to cave in during that, but then you begin to buy into the teaching of Balaam and Balak. Oh, you, you believed in the Son, that He was crucified, that He rose from the dead, that, that He gives eternal life. They're faithful to that. They, didn't, they never denied the deity of Jesus Christ. And I want you to hear this. Listen, they never did that. 
But Jesus brings up this issue. You hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block. Now, in the Old Testament, you probably know the story. There was a, a prophet named Balaam. And as the Israelites were coming towards the promised land, every city, every nation they would go through, God would give them military victory. God would allow them and, and use them as they made their way through the wilderness in a, in a mighty way. And all the nations were defeated by them because God was with them. And so Balak, a king, was afraid that as they came towards him, towards Moab, that, that he would be defeated. So he hires one of their prophets, a guy by the name of Balaam. He says, I want you to curse the Israelites. I'll pay you. So this prophet for hire. He goes, okay, yeah, I'll curse them. And he went to curse them, but he, he found out that every time he tried to curse them, what came out of his mouth was blessing. And he went back and goes, hey, I, I keep trying to, to curse them, but out of my mouth comes nothing but blessing. He said, but I thought of another plan. And so Balak the king goes, well, what is it? He says, let's get all the Moabite women, the nice-looking ones, the most seductive women you have, and let's dress them up in, in their finery, and, and let's take them into the Israelites' camp, and let's trap them into seduction and sexual rights of the pagan style of worship that included sexual immorality. And guess what? Yeah, the men fell. And God sent a plague. And the prophet was in, involved in that. And what's going on in Pergamos is the teaching of Balaam. Not that they don't believe, not that they don't have good doctrine, they believe in Jesus, the Lord and Savior, who, who, who suffered and, and died for them. But slowly, here's what's happening. Listen, they're being drawn away into a lifestyle and practices of sexual immorality and perverseness that really is opposed to what they say they believe. Good doctrine. Yeah, they know the Bible even willing to, to suffer if need be. The, the enemy can't change their mind about Jesus. So he comes in another way. He comes through seduction. And I, I believe he do, his doing and has done and is continuing to do that even in our world, in our culture today. may, may start very slowly, maybe just a, Seductive ad on TV. Oh, wow. Hmm. The Super Bowl. Maybe it's a, a, a TV series, some steamy thing you get sucked into that's lewd or the internet. And, and pretty soon you have these oppressive, seductive thoughts. And, and you, you know, or maybe it's the justifying of relationships and fantasy and not careful. Oh, oh, I still believe in Jesus. I, I still know the Bible. I'll never deny him, but if not careful, you can find yourself start living outside of the lifestyle that represents him. Cheating on your spouse or living with your boyfriend or girlfriend or getting involved in all kinds of sexual sin that are all condemned, listen, by Scripture. Jesus is warning here, even though you say you believe and willing to suffer, he says, you can be pulled away by the doctrine of Balaam, which in this case, and, and perhaps in our case, is deceived and seduced. See, here's the thing. I, I bet I could ask some questions about Jesus, and 99.9% .9 of the people in this room could answer them. I could say, where was Jesus born? Oh, 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 Bethlehem. I, I know that. Okay. Who are his parents? Oh, 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 Joseph and Mary. Yeah, I got that. Who baptized him? Oh, John, John the Baptist. I mean, we have all this knowledge. How did he die? Oh, he died on the cross. He rose from the dead. Who sold him out? Oh, it was Judas for 30 pieces of silver. Who denied him? 
Peter three times. And on and on and on. We could go with all kinds of right answers. And I believe in Pergamos, they could have done it as well. But they didn't have a life. And here's the issue with Jesus. Coming with that two-edged sword. They didn't have a life that was really surrendered to Jesus. Somewhere they, they bought into this mindset that, that, you know, I can believe in Jesus and still live an immoral, seductive life. I'll stand in hard times. I have right doctrine. I, I, I'm a Christian. I prayed a prayer. I got baptized. But living a lifestyle that's totally foreign to who Jesus is and grieving his Holy Spirit. I mean, I, I could visit you in the hospital. Maybe you're in there sick. I could walk in your room with a white coat on, have a stethoscope around my neck, my own private parking place out in the parking lot, Dr. John, I could step into your room, look at you, and say, hmm, wow, have my little clipboard, come see you day after day after day. And one time I walk in, and I, I look at you laying there, and I say, you know what? Tomorrow I'd like to take out your appendix. Well, let me tell you this. I'd be the last guy. If you want taking out your appendix, I don't even know where your appendix is. <laughs> I guess I could Google it, but you don't want me taking it out because I'm not a doctor. I didn't go to med school. I've never interned. I haven't passed those exams. I haven't surrendered my life to all that's required to be a doctor and follow all the guidelines of the medical community. Uh, I could not even prescribe for you medicine for your appendix. See, if you're a Christian, it's not just praying and getting wet or dunked in the water. It's turning from that which is wrong. Jesus says, not, not only do I come to you with the, the word, the, the sharp two-edged sword, but he also says, you know, that, that you should, in verse 16, Repent. There's two things in the Christian life that, that come to us over and over again. I submit to you they're in this chapter. One is the Word of God, that it's like a two-edged sword, and it exposes, and it gives the truth, and it reveals us, and it reveals Him. And then there's how we respond to it. And the word Jesus uses here is to repent, to, to turn and go the other way, to to change your mind about, about what you're doing and what you're saying and how you're acting and to open your heart again. The Bible says if, if anyone be in Christ, he's, he's a new creature and, and old things pass away and all things start becoming new. You change, not just your mind, but your heart and your lifestyle. And here in Pergamos, they're right doctrinally. Here's the, here's the problem. But they're wrong morally. And so he says, we, we got to deal with this. See, you and I cannot live in an ongoing lifestyle, an ongoing lifestyle of fornication and sex outside of marriage or homosexuality or adultery and continue to call yourself, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. But because I, in my mind, I believe certain things. Now, that's not a popular teaching. Now, you may stumble and fall in some of these areas, but an ongoing lifestyle that embraces it and thinks it's okay. Jesus says, I know, I know who you are. I know where you are. I know what you're doing. And, and, and we, we got to talk about this. Jesus warns us about the teaching of Balaam. In Romans 6, chapter 1 and 2, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue 
and sin that grace may abound? Well, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin and basically saying continue to live as if we never did? It's just not truthful. And then he talks about this Nicolaitan situation. He says, I have a few things against you. You hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to stumble. He talks about the sexual rights and the sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. He says, which thing I basically hate. These were, these were rulers and leaders, these Nicolaitans, within the church that have sort of set themselves up. as leaders and teachers and guides, that you really can't go any further or deeper or, or, or have more relationship with God without going through us. We're the ones you have to get the real truth from. The Nicolaitans had set it up that way. If you really want to know God, it'd be like, like me coming to you and saying, you know, if you really want to know the Lord you got to know him through me because you're not going to go any further in your faith without hanging out with me. It's like, what? Now, we, we, have, we have one high priest, and his name is Jesus, right? It's not some pastor. It's not some religious leader. In, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, we have a, a verse that says, for there is one God... And then he says there's only one mediator between God and men, and that's the man, Jesus. But the Nicolaitans had taught them something else. So, so Jesus deals with these issues. Balaam, the seduction and immoral lifestyle, and this leadership that's become unbalanced and unbiblical. And he gives two ways, and I mentioned this in verse 12. He, he, he talks about the two-edged sword, which is the word, and in verse 16, he says, repent. So here's how I'm going to deal with it. God's word exposes the heart, gives the truth, calls immorality what it really is. And then we choose to repent or not. And isn't it amazing the amount of self-deception and justification and compromise we're capable of convincing ourselves of? Oh, we're experts at it. The heart is deceitfully wicked, and who can know it, the Bible says. I mean, I, I've been doing the, the, the pastoral role for a long time. I've done, I was at a restaurant with some friends last night, and I saw a guy used to come to the church. I walked over and spoke to him. He goes, 25 years ago. I go, 25 years ago what? He goes, you did our wedding over there in the church. And that's a similar scenario I go through over and over and over again. I said, oh, great. Praise the Lord. But, but through that process, I've counseled so many couples who get married, and my first question is always this, do you know the Lord? Are you Christians? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then sometimes as you dig into it, after you find out they're Christians, you find it, but, but we're living together. Oh, you are. Well, you know that's wrong in the Bible, right? Yeah, but there's always the big but. And so, so why are you doing it? You, you know, you should separate. Uh, well, you see, financially, or you know, this, and they got these circumstances. So, so you're living together and you're involved sexually, but you're Christians. Yeah, well, see, in, in order for this, and you know, financially, and I said, oh, so, so financially, you have to do this. Yeah. Well, where is that? Is that in Maccabees or something? And. If you're financially unable, it's okay to have sex before a marriage and live together. Oh, okay, there it is. No, it's not in there. We're in love. Uh, this is another one. We're in love, and God knows our heart. Yeah, he knows your heart. We're, we're, we're married in his eyes. Oh. And yet we know God sets up God's into 
order, he's into authority. You say, well, well let me ask you this. Um, what do your parents think about it? Well, they're not real crazy about it, you know, but, you know, they kind of understand. Oh, so parents don't really like it. No, no. Well, that's one level of authority. Well, what about the government? Do they recognize you as being married? You got a license? Can you, you know, file your IRS tax returns? No, no, the government doesn't really, you know. What about, I know the church doesn't. So those are the three levels of authority. None of them agree with it. The, 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 the parents, the, the government, the, the church, but God does. Yeah, God, God, God believes we're okay. Oh, wow. The, the subtle deception of the enemy, and, and the Lord says, no, no, wait a minute. If you, will, if you let me, I want to bring the sharp two-edged sword, and let's, let's look at this. Let's expose it. And at the close of the letter, he, he offers some some interesting things to those de- involved in false teaching and deception. In verse 17, he says, he who has an ear. Now, I would submit to you that almost everyone in here has an ear, right? At least one. So what he's saying is he who's willing to listen, not he, he who has a physical ear, Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I'll give hidden manna. I'll give a white stone. And there'll be a name written which no one knows except him who receives a hidden manna, white stone, and a new name. What what is that? What is this stuff? In that culture, they would probably understand. I mean, manna, we know, was food that came down from, from heaven. Jesus talks about food that you know not of when he ministered to that Samaritan woman at the well. If you remember that story, they, they, they'd come to Samaria. There was a well outside the city, and the disciples were with Jesus, and they're all there. They've been traveling. They got there around noon and been traveling that all morning by foot, and they were hungry. And so someone said, I don't know who said it, uh, hey, we should go into town and get some food. And Jesus said, well, I'm, I'm going to hang here. And I don't know why they all had to go get food, but all of them went. Maybe they had had this problem before and some had gone, come back, there's only a few fries left in the bag. I don't know, I don't know what the trouble was, but it's like, we're all going. So they're all going to get the food. And, and when they come back, Jesus had been talking to a woman which is not culturally too cool anyway. And, and she had been a woman who'd been married five times and was living with someone. And Jesus had been discussing with her about himself being the Messiah. And she came to faith. The disciples get back and they're like, what's, what's Jesus doing? He said, Jesus, we got some food. He goes, well, no, I'm good. What, what do you mean? Who gave you food? He goes, you know, I have food uh, to eat that you don't even know about. It's hidden. And they go, well, what is it? He goes, my food is to do the will of the Father who sent me. And he had been ministering to this woman who was very broken and very isolated and very outcast. And and the Father had somehow, I don't know how this works, but being obedient and ministering, he began to get new energy. He began to be nourished. He he had this strengthening. And Jesus was like, hey, I don't need any physical food right now. I'm, I'm full. And when you feed upon the Lord... Like Jesus fed upon the Father at that time, there is a spiritual strength and a boldness and anointing. It's like like manna from heaven. And he says, those of you, he says, if you have an ear to hear about what I'm speaking to you about, about lifestyle, about, uh, you know, religious leaders, he goes, I I, want to give you this, this ability to feed upon me, to endure hardship and seduction. To feed on his word and not your flesh and not your desires. He goes, I want you to feed on something that will strengthen and change you. Where you can say no to Balaam, no to seduction, no to the Nicolaitans, and yes to spiritual intimacy. 
And then there's this white stone. It's very difficult to find much about that, but it seems like in that culture, in that time, there was the ancient Romans would be given a white stone to enter private meetings or celebrations, kind of like a VIP pass. It'd have a name written on it. If they showed that, they were, they were welcomed in. And there was that special name. Maybe you're here and, and as a couple or, or with a kid or whatever, and you have a, a special name for your husband or your wife. Poopsie. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Pumpkin. I'll never forget when our son Ryan, true story, he was about maybe 10. We should go to a little private Christian school over in Pensacola. It was small. I think he had like 12 kids in his class. Ryan was just 10 years old. And I remember we were dropping him off one morning. It was over in Pensacola. And Lynn gave Ryan a big hug and a kiss and said, see you later, pumpkin. And all his buddies heard it. And so I went to pick him up that afternoon around 2 or something with school, and I, you'd have to walk down the hall and check him out of the room. And, and there was Ryan, you know, he's just having a great day. And I said, Ryan, let's go. Come on, time to go. So he gets up, and all his buddies stood up. And as he walked out the door, they all said it at the same time, see you later, pumpkin. Just like... <laughs> But here's the thing. The Lord has a special name for you. He knows it. That will so mark you when you see him that it will completely identify who you are. Max Licato, I don't know if you've read any of his books, but he wrote one a long time ago called The Applause of Heaven. And he talks about time. It's very interesting how he he shares this story. He says, there's a time that you will stand before the Lord. And you'll be home soon, he says. You may not have noticed you're closer than you've ever been before. Each moment is a step taken. Each breath is a page turned. Each day is a mile marker and a mountain climbed. And man, it goes by so quick. Max says, how did I get here so soon? (laughs) You're closer to home, he says, than you've ever been before. How much time do I have left? He discusses the anticipation in his own life as he would travel at times and speak. And he, he told of one incident when he was coming home. He was flying into the airport and, you know, the plane lands. And finally, the door opens to the plane. He said people are jostling into the aisle. They're grabbing their luggage. And he's sort of near the middle. And he's waiting, you know, for, the, for that procession to start moving. You know how that is. He said, finally, we're out the door, we're onto the ramp, and I'm walking past the area where the, my family's waiting, he says. And I can see some people up there, and finally, he says, I see my wife and, 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 and my kids. And, and he said, and there next to my wife was my little seven-year-old son, and he was clapping, just clapping. He says, when you're appointed time comes, you'll descend the ramp, you'll enter the city, you'll see faces of people you know, but in the back, there'll be one who would rather die than live without you, and he'll lift his pierced hands, and he'll begin to applaud. And I would add another thing to that, and he will call that special name, and you will know it. Pergamos, listen, great doctrine. Willing to stand and suffer and endure. But what about standing through seduction when the TV's on or the computer's available or sensuality and pride starts to seduce? You may have the truth. Jesus says, know me like hidden manna. Feed upon me. 
See, see, one day, uh, we don't know when it is. None of us do. It's a crazy thing about life. You'll go home. And it's so important that you know him. But it's even more important, I believe, that he know you. See, there'll come that time, and and there was in the Bible, you've heard it, where people said, Lord, Lord, I I prophesied in your name. I knew the Bible. I had great doctrine. I knew scripture. I knew all about you. And Jesus shares those terrible words. He says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice wickedness. And it's it's a a chilling thing that Jesus says, because there's these people who say, well, I, I know you. See, the, the question I think we have to ask ourselves over and over again as we, we, are, we are confronted with a two-edged sword and that, that word repent is not only do I know him, but does he know me? Have you repented from that which you know is wrong? Have you started walking with him? Is it just head knowledge or is it a, is it a call to a lifestyle, you know, my prayer is for, for me, for Lynn, for our kids, for our grandkids, for, for all of you, is that you would never, ever miss heaven. That you would never just have an a, a intellectual understanding of who Jesus is, but that you would allow the, the two-edged sword to, to, to reveal and, and, and call you to not just a mental understanding but a lifestyle that is being transformed day by day as you feed upon that hidden manna and looking forward to the day when he calls you home and he applauds and says, hey, here's that name I gave you. I know nobody knows when that day is, but we don't want to just believe. We want to also know him. And him know us. Amen.